Hello. Today we are learning Parshat Amor. And the Torah reading begins with the words, say to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and tell them. So our sages associate this command with the obligation of chinuch, of education, the education of children, commenting, it is written, say, and then it's written, tell them. So why is this said twice, say, tell them? And it's to warn the children or to adjure the children, the, the, to adjure the adults, to warn the adults, to empower the adults concerning the raising of the children. And God said to Moses, say to the priests, the sons of Aaron, you shall say to them not to allow themselves to become impure. So there is, a, the Parsha speaks about that. We're not going into that right now. But what it's saying is to, that it's their responsibility to teach the children, to teach the young priests, but also to make sure that they stay away from impurities. In other words, as ministers in the Holy Temple, the Kohanim were privileged to have been granted a higher degree of sanctity. And privilege always comes with responsibility. And one of the responsibilities was to maintain a rigorous level of purity. So it's a lesson. This lesson is not only for the members of the priestly tribe, but for all of us, that every parent and teacher has the duty, the obligation to educate the younger generation accordingly. Now, educating one's child is a developing process. That parents are responsible to teach their children right from wrong and giving them the basics of education is a given in Judaism. And it's planted into our DNA by our forefather, Abraham, about whom God said, I cherish him because he commands his sons and his household after him, that they should keep the way of God to perform righteousness and justice. So we got that right away from our father, Abraham. But this Parsha is up-leveling this teaching by giving responsibility to the priests, the Kohanim, to teach and guide their children and all the priestly children even more. So implied in this, it's not just for the priests, and we are a priestly people, and it's for all of us, is to take responsibility for the education of his children. Now, we can't sit back passively and expect that education will happen naturally. It won't. Unless energy and effort is invested, personal effort, not just relying on teachers and schools, a child's character will not grow. Now, the Rebbe Rashab taught us that just like the Torah requires, this is what he said, just like the Torah requires people to put on tefillin every day, it requires us to spend a half an hour each day thinking about our children's education. So how can we educate in the best way? That's what we're going to talk about. So the word emor, the first word in the Parsha, means to use gentle words, as opposed to the word daber, which also means speak, but is associated with a harsh tone. The word for say, emor, say to them, gives us a guidance in how to educate children using gentle words. So I'll tell you, there will be some stories in this class. That's the plan. So here's a story. A person who was very knowledgeable with excellent teaching skills once went to the principal of a Torah school and asked to be a teacher. And the teacher was very impressed by his resume. But when he met him, he decided not to offer him this employment. And the younger man was surprised and asked why he wasn't being accepted. And the principal answered, quite obviously you have studied a lot and you have a lot of information. You're also a good communicator, but there's a problem. I'm sorry to say that your faith and your awe of God are somewhat lacking. And the applicant knew that. He knew that what the principal saying was true, but he still wanted the job. So he said, listen, 
what difference do, do my beliefs make? I understand your standards and we'll stick to the curriculum. I'll teach them exactly what you want them to learn. And the principal said, no. Children learn by example. You'll produce students exactly like you. They will know what the Torah demands of them, but they will lack the desire and inspiration to commit themselves to it. Now this word lihaz here, which is the Hebrew word translated as to adjure, to give the responsibility to do it, shares the same root as the word zohar, meaning radiance. So the term lihaz here implies that by working to educate our children, our own souls will shine with splendor. So when we educate, it brings shining to our own souls. Now, the most effective means by which a parent educates his child is by example. So when a parent continuously and systematically shows a virtue in her own conduct, her child would be likely to have it. The children see what we do more than what we say. And so the children are affected by that because our actions speak much louder than our words. So to make an impression on our children, the qualities and character traits which we want to share have to shine within our own personalities. What we tell them won't do it. What we want to show them and teach them has to shine in our own personalities. And this teaches a fundamental lesson with regard to education. It has to be characterized by radiant light. That's the word Zohar that comes from this. In general, there are two ways to persuade children to reject undesirable behavior. One is to emphasize how low it is or to show the positive alternative. So Lahaz here underscores the importance of spreading light because a little light dispels much darkness. And by shining light, a person can kindle the inner light, which every person possesses. So when we shine our light on them, it brings their light out. So when a child appreciates light and warmth within Judaism, he is attracted and will want to internalize it within himself. So when we are excited about Judaism, it's almost Shabbos, rather than it's almost Shabbos. They hear what we say, it's almost Shabbos. The children look forward to Shabbos. And that's something that we have to do in how we speak and how we give examples and how we shine our own light out. So when a child appreciates light and warmth within Judaism, he wants to internalize it within himself. Now, this it could be very small, a smile, something which indicates that this is the path to true and genuine satisfaction and meaningful joy. These are the motivators that will be effective in encouraging Jewish practice and involvement. So when we say it in a good way, in a way full of light, and they see that we're excited, then they become excited also. And if those qualities are lacking, it's going to be hard for the children to persevere because they don't have a good role modeling. So even as adults, we ourselves have a difficulty in overcoming our desires for immediate gratification. So how can we expect more from a child? So instead, a giving a positive, rewarding experience has to be an integral part of education. And educators should shine out that kind of energy and vitality that invites a student to make Judaism part of their lives. So when we say it's almost Pesach Sheni, it's almost Lagba Omer, we are relating to our children that Judaism is exciting to us and that everything is meaningful to us. This approach gives a new definition 
of what an educator has, has to be. In other words, if he has to shine out light, what that means is that he's not just a source of information. He's a person whose Torah knowledge has been internalized to the point where it has shaped his own character and invigorated him with joy, direction, and purpose. So that knowledge, that Torah knowledge has to be integrated within to us and shape our own character and invigorate us with joy, direction, and purpose. And then he could be a role model, a person who lives with authenticity. The Torah he learns becomes real to him. The mitzvahs that he learns come into him and they're real for him. And if he needs to work on it, he does. So when a person sees that in someone, when a person sees that in another person, he wants to learn from him and he seeks out the opportunity to do that. So in addition to being a good example, there has to be gentle and clear conversation. So we also have to raise ourselves. We can't think, if we think, well, I'm there, I got it, I'm the adult, I know what I'm doing. We're not so there because we are always supposed to be growing, always supposed to be up leveling. We're teaching that to the children, but the children have to see that in us also. So we have to raise ourselves, not just raise our children. And we have to be careful not to do mitzvahs by rote. And if we see that we're not studying Torah, then we need to work on guiding ourselves for it. So <clears throat> just like we clean our clothes and work on what needs to be worked on, we have to give ourselves the time and attention to clean up our own ways. Unless we shine, we need to, until we shine, we have to keep working on shining. And this is a process that needs daily practice. Just like our silver candlesticks for Shabbos need to be polished until they shine, from time to time, they need to be repolished. This is not a one-time action. This is a process. And there are times when it seems like a struggle, but when we decide to go forward, like Nachshin Amina Ben Amina Dab decided to go right to the Red Sea because he knew he was heading for connecting to God at Mount Sinai, he didn't focus on being stuck. He didn't focus on there's a, there's a sea over there. How am I going to get there? He just moved forward. <coughs> we need to know that God is with us. And that when we go forward, God is helping us. And going forward, we will succeed. King Solomon says in his book of Proverbs, he's the wisest man, educate the child in accordance with his way, so that also when he grows old, he will not depart from it. Educate the child according to his way. Now, one thing that that means is that we have to relate to the child on the level of his maturity. Each child also has her own nature. Education has to be suitable for that little person. And that person already has her own way. If we notice some children watch, some children listen, some need time to take in what they're learning. And actually we each learn in our own way. And when we pay attention to who our child is, then we're able to guide them to go forward in their own way that they need to be educated. Some children need books, some people need stories, some people need to be guided to listen to what you're going to say, or some people need to see what you're going to show them. We are each living, growing beings. We should always say, I am a finite being, yet I'm also infinite in the sense that I'm always maturing. Every day we can grow closer to our potential as we grow beyond yesterday's truth. What we did yesterday was what we were up to yesterday. Today is a new day and we each have a new truth. And we have to go and develop 
till we get to that truth and utilize that truth. So that means everybody's got to go forward to a new level of truth and a new level of utilizing potential. As our children learn from us incrementally, they know that they are little and that their parents are bigger. That little girl wants to be bigger too, like us. So who we are affects who the children will be. And as long as we keep journeying each according to our way, our children are going to see that. And that's a great lesson for them. On Mother's Day, a dear, dear friend sent me a beautiful note. And what is a mother really in reality? A nurturer of another's neshama to be able to guide another person toward the fulfillment of their God-given mission in life. Say it again, because I like it so much. And what is a mother in reality? A nurturer of another's neshama to be able to guide another person toward the fulfillment of their God-given mission in life. I was very touched by this. This applies to all of us, whether or not we personally have birthed children. As we continue to grow, we're all nurturers who inspire others toward fulfilling their life's mission. And each of us is a person who goes out into the world and shines wherever we shine. My shoemaker, I always say hello to him with a big smile and I can see that he lights up because he's a little bit in the back. Who pays attention to him? The person who comes to the front is the person who talks to the customers. But I say to him, hello, with a smile. And he lights up because who has seen him all day? Maybe nobody. Maybe the people with problems in their shoes that want help will have to talk to him. But just a hello for hello's sake is something that we can do. And we never know how we're nurturing another person by shining out to them. And I find this message so precious. And what is a mother in reality? A nurturer of another's neshama to be able to guide another person toward the fulfillment of their God-given mission in life. So precious. When a person has studied to the point that the Torah has become part of his inner being, its godly power will fill him with light and life. And he will then naturally become a teacher because others will watch him and seek to emulate his way of life. When we work on our own divine service and have Ahavis Yisrael and love each other, our light will shine out and inspire, illuminate, and educate those we have come in contact with. And as we work on communicating and teaching our children, we also grow. The positive traits we want to give over become reinforced and strengthened through sharing them with others. And our own souls will shine, as the Zohar said, in splendor. So what I would like to do now is share some stories. Stories from the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe about his education from his father. And these are excerpts from diary entries and transcribed talks in which the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, who lived from 1880 to 1950, describes the education he received from his father, who was the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Sholem Dovber Schneerson, who lived from 1860 to 1920. Telling stories is a wonderful way of educating. But these particular stories are stories from a very conscious person, from a Rebbe who wrote about how he learned from his father who was a Rebbe. So these are very pure examples of how his father taught him. And there's a lot to learn from this 
in terms of raising ourselves and raising our children. So the first story, which is a story I really love, when I was four years old, I asked my father, why did God make people with two eyes? Why not with one eye? Just like they have one nose and one mouth. And his father asked him, do you know the Aleph Bait? Yes. Then you know that there are very similar Hebrew letters, the Shin and the Sin. They look exactly the same. Can you tell the difference between them? The Shin has a dot on its right side. The Sin on its left, I replied. And this is what his father answered. There are things with which one must, there are things which one must look upon with the right eye. Remember, right is chesed, loving kindness. Left is boundaries, strictness, no. So in a certain way, the right is more toward yes, and the left is more toward no and boundaries. So his father said to him, there are things which one must look on with a right eye, with affection and empathy. And there are things to be looked at with the left eye, with indifference and detachment. On a sitter, a prayer book, or on a Jew, one should look with a right eye. On a candy or a toy, one should look with the left eye. It's very, very interesting. I remember when the children, my children used to say when they were young, I love ice cream. And I would say, I like ice cream. Love, we love Hashem. We love our sitter. We love our Torah. We love our fellow Jew. We love ice cream. I like ice cream. Now, that was obviously a lesson that comes from this teaching and this kind of teaching. So this is really teaching people how to look at the world with discernment and recognize that not everything is the same. It's very important to teach the children and the children within us what is really important. There's an expression in Torah called ikar and tafel. Ikar means what's really important. Tafel means, you know, kind of falls to the side. It's good, it's nice, but it's not what's important. Like when we are in a supermarket buying an orange, we want the orange to have a shell around it. But then it's not ikar. It's ikar in the store that we can see from the shell of the of the orange that it's a good, healthy, juicy orange from our look at the outside when we touch it. But then when we bring it home, then the shell becomes tafel. It's like you, to, to fall, it takes it off. We don't need the shell anymore. Now the ikar is what's on the inside. So we have to be able to know the difference. Now, Rabbi Manus Friedman once told this story. I was there and he told the story in a way, he added something that was a very, very important lesson to me in terms of raising children. Rabbi Friedman told exactly the story. And after the story, he said, what do you think? You think his father just came up with this? What actually happened was that his father knew that there was something he wanted to teach his son. And how was he going to teach him this? And then when his son, his little four-year-old asked this question, why do we have two eyes? His father saw it as an opportunity to be able to put the information in that he wanted to teach. And I have found this to be a tremendously, tremendously important 
aspect of education. We all know that there are things that we want to tell the children or that sometimes we want to tell our own child that we want to work on. But when it's something we want to tell the child, we can't just barge in and say, okay, listen, from now on, you're going to do this and this and this because they're not going to hear it and they're not going to get it. But sometimes an opportunity comes up. They ask a question. It's interesting. There was a time that I wanted to tell something to one of the children and there was not, the child was not going to be interested in hearing this information. But then a week later, that child who wasn't such a child anymore, asked me a question. Aha, I thought, here is the moment. I now have the opportunity to say what I wanted to say. So within the answer that they wanted, I was able to give the information. And at that point, the person said, oh, that's so interesting. I didn't think of it that way. Child raising takes time and process. So we have to do this. We have to recognize that we can't teach everything at all at once because the Rambam says, teach a child according to his way. And then he'll be able to keep growing. But when we put a seed into the ground, we can't pull it up every day to see if it's growing. We can't either put, you know, gallons and gallons and gallons of water on it saying, look, get yourself up. It's time to grow. We have to take care of it and nurture it through process. And then it will grow. So this is our work on process. So this is about teaching children. There's a way to look at things that we love that is with chesed. There's a way to look at things with, with gavor, with boundaries. And that also has to do with action. That we have to say, this is really important. We have to light the candle for Shabbat on time. This is more important than whatever else they want to do. So there are times we have to say, now we have to get ready. We have to go to the candles. That is ikar. That is essential. So teaching them to discern the difference between what is essential and what is not is very, very important. So I once saw um, a little statement on a tea bag handle, you know, these little cards. It said, discern between a flower and a weed. So we have to know the difference. What is this? Is this good for me? Is this for now? So this is a process. Okay, so that was the first story. Now then there's another story. This is a story that he says, the previous Rebbe, when he was a young boy, he said, I remembered how, as I was still a small child, studying, I'm not going to say the story exactly as he wrote it, but he was, he was in Cheder. He was studying. He had a teacher. And remember, his father was the Rebbe, was the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And when he had time, he would run to the synagogue to listen to his father pray. And there was a minyan, a group of at least 10 men praying. And he would feel very sad. He said he would feel heavy in his heart. And he would ask himself, why doesn't father pray briskly as the whole congregation does, as my uncle does? And it says he once asked why this is so. And his uncle said to him, probably joking, that his father can't pronounce the Hebrew words easily. And we're talking about a Lubavitcher Rebbe, a tzaddik, a sage, a Rebbe. And this boy agonized over this. This is what he wrote. I agonized greatly over this. Once I came to the synagogue, nobody was there. Only father is standing his face to the wall, praying. He's entreating God. 
He's ple pleading for mercy, but I don't understand. Why is he entreating more than all the other worshipers? Why does he need God's mercy more than other people? And suddenly father began to sob, to sob. And it says, my heart sank within me. Father is crying. Not a soul in the house of God in the synagogue and father is crying. I bent an ear and I heard him say, Shema Yisrael. And he sobs, Hashem Elokeinu, God, our God. And he sobs. He then falls silent. And then again in a powerful voice emerging from the depths of his heart, Hashem Echad, God is one. In a flood of tears, a terrifying voice. I just want to stop for a moment to say that when he says Shema Yisrael, it's a meditation. It's not just I have to say it. It's a meditation. He says it deeply. And every word is meaningful to him. But this little boy, this time I couldn't contain myself. I went to my mother and wept. Why does father pray longer than all the worshipers? My uncle Raza says that father has difficulty pronouncing the words. Why can't father recite Hebrew at a proper speed? And today I saw that father is crying. Come with me, mother, and I'll show you that father is crying. My mother told me, go to your grandmother. In other words, to the, the Rebbe's father and ask her. Perhaps she can do something about this. So I rushed over to take the advice of my mother and went to my late grandmother, the saintly Rebbetson, and asked her my innocent question. My grandfather, my grandmother said to me, your father is a great Hasid and Sadiq, a great righteous person. With each and every word he says, he first thinks of the meaning of the word that he's saying. I remember how at that moment she calmed me and how from then on my attitude toward my father changed. For I then knew that father is apart from and above other men. With his every move, I saw that father is father. Father wakes up in the morning, puts on the tefillin, and reads the Shema. Then he goes to serve his mother tea. And then he says, he writes in his diary, I also want to do that for my mother. Remember, he's a little boy, but they don't let him because they say that he might get hurt by the boiling water. Father washes his hands before meals, but not like other people. And this is a Chabad custom. Other people pour water over their hands only twice, but father takes the pitcher with his right hand hands it over to his left hand and pours three times in succession over his right hand. Then he takes another pitcher of water and using the towel to hold it in his right hand so it doesn't get wet again from the other water, he pours three times over his left. In other words, he's washing his hands with such focus and concentration. And each move is with presence. Every day before the afternoon Minchas prayers, father again goes to serve a cup of tea to his mother and sits there for about an hour. Everyone speaks, speaks with gusto, but father is mostly silent. Sometimes he speaks, speaking softly. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe had been told, I don't remember if it was by his grandfather, but he had been told that it would be a good idea for him to keep a diary. So he has wonderful, wonderful diaries telling about what he experienced. 
There's so much to be learned from this story. So much. One thing simple is that this boy is expecting his father to be like everybody else. And I have to say that people think that's wonderful to just follow along with the crowd. And if something's going on, that's not good. But if nobody else is saying it, then you now why should I be the one who says it? That is not an education. Every person is unique. We have to educate people to be authentic, to be real in what they're doing. And we have to teach our children that nobody is like anybody else, that God makes every snowflake unique and you are special to God. And that every person has, is in the world for something special. We're all in the world for one purpose, keep Torah and mitzvahs, but, and make this a world where God is known. But the way that we do it is unique for each person. And we need to teach this to the children. We need to teach this to the children. I remember one time uh, we went with, I think, four children to Israel. And the way the tickets worked out, my husband went back with two of them on one plane and I went back with two of them on another plane. So I had two girls with me. <clears throat> we were standing on line kind of far back, but at the counter, there was a man, at least six foot two, banging on the table, shouting and banging on the table. So I, I said to the children, hmm, that's interesting. They said, why is that man banging on the table and shouting like this? He's a grown up. I said, yes, he looks like a very tall grown up. Yes, that's true. But why is he doing that? And in that moment, I saw a teaching opportunity. So I said, calmly, he's having a tantrum. What? Why is he having a tantrum? Well, I guess he didn't like what the person said. Maybe he didn't get exactly what he wanted. And so he's having a tantrum, a tantrum. I said, yes. When mothers let their children have tantrums all the time, then I guess they don't stop having tantrums and they keep having tantrums even when they're grown up people. And they went, oh, that's terrible. And I thought to myself, yes, they got it. They have to see that they have choice in their behavior, that they have choice to be authentic, that they have choice to be who they really are. And that when we're saying Shema or we're learning or we're praying, that we have to really do it. There, there is a lot of learning that we do in Torah. There's a place where it talks about different levels of giving tzedakah. And we have to know that when we give to somebody, in my neighborhood, people come to the door, people come from Israel and they come to the door sometimes. One time a, a person said to me, it doesn't matter how much you give, that's God's job. I'm just here to ask. And your job is to give something. That was, he taught me. But when I give it, I do what I can to look at them in the eyes and to give them a blessing, whatever I give them, have a successful day or however I say it. And I find that people feel, oh, it's not so much fun to walk around from place to place asking for money, but when somebody looks them in the eyes and sees them as a person, then that is important, really important. And they feel, seen. But when the children see that we give in a way we don't, oh, so annoying. No, that we give in, should never be saying that's so annoying. 
But when we, they see that we give with care and interest, then what they do is they want to emulate that because they see that it makes a difference. They see the look on the person's face that you're giving to, and they realize that's really important. So we need to teach the children how to recognize that they can't necessarily learn from what everybody does, but everybody does it. I remember one of the children once wanted to go out for pizza at night. She was, I don't know, 12. Boys, girls hanging out, having pizza. And we, we didn't do that. And she said to me, but everybody in my class will be there. Everybody does it. Oh, okay. Like everybody, like who? Uh, she does. Oh uh, yeah, and she does. That doesn't sound exactly like everybody, but it doesn't really matter what everybody does. We have to decide what we do. It's a very important lesson for the children that uh, I'll tell you that children learn from their parents. One thing they learn from their parents is what to do. And one thing they learn from their parents is what not to do. So we want to be role models of what to do. And if there's something that we do that we felt was wrong, then sometimes we need to say, hmm, I feel bad that I use that word. I don't use that word. It's not a good word. Hmm. Okay. I'll be careful not to use that word. You don't even have to say it to them. You just have to say it to yourself in front of them, if that happens. And then they hear that you're saying to yourself, hmm, I have to raise myself in this area because I don't like what I did. So when the son is learning about his father's authenticity and how his father is really doing what he's doing, that is a huge influence on him. So here is the third story. That's what I had in mind, is these stories. It was the summer of 1896, and father and I were strolling in the fields of Balivka, a hamlet near Lubavitch in Russia. The grain was near to ripening, and the wheat and grass swayed gently in the breeze. So they were walking together. And when they were walking together, before I go into the story, it's very important to have time with each child. Sometimes what's nice is to take one child out on their birthday, just one child by themselves. Sometimes it's nice to take a child when you just for an hour to go someplace or do something or have, have a chance to talk one child at a time because that's where you see how to educate the child according to her way or his way, because you understand who that child is rather than being part of a group all the time. The children need your individuality. It's very important to greet each child looking at, not say, hi kids. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Yassi. To look at each one, to greet them uniquely. So, this is the Rebbe Rashab is taking his little son with him on a walk in the forest. Obviously, this is an opportunity to teach. So it says in the diary, said father to me, see godliness? Every movement of each stalk and grass was included in God's primordial thought of creation in God's all-embracing vision of history. And each is guided by divine providence toward a godly purpose. Amazing lesson. Every stalk of wheat, everything that God makes, makes is part of the all-embracing vision of history. 
and is guided by divine providence toward a godly purpose. One grain of wheat has a godly purpose. Walking, we entered the forest. Engrossed in what I had heard, excited by the softness and seriousness of Father's words, I absentmindedly tore a leaf off a passing tree. Holding it a while in my hands, I continued my thoughtful walking and occasionally tearing small pieces of leaf and casting them to the winds. The holy Arizal, great mystic and sadic, said father to me, says that not only is every leaf on a tree a creation invested with divine life, created for a specific purpose within God's intent and creation, but also that within each and every leaf, there is a spark of a soul that has descended to the earth to find its correction and fulfillment. The Talmud, father continued, rules, and there's a whole paragraph in here that I'm not going to say, but the bottom line is the father, the Talmud rules that a man is always responsible for his actions, whether awake or asleep. Nevertheless, our sages maintain that because there's, you know, but when you're awake and when you're asleep in different situations, how can you do it? But the bottom line of what he said is, nevertheless, even though he's speaking about the differences between awake and asleep, our sages maintain that man is always responsible for his actions, whether awake or asleep. Only this moment we have spoken of divine providence and unthinkingly you tore off a leaf played with it in your hands, twisting, squashing, and tearing it to pieces, throwing it in all directions. How can one be so callous toward a creation of God? This leaf was created by the Almighty toward a specific purpose and is imbued with a divine life force. It has a body, and it has its life. In what way is the eye of this leaf inferior to yours? Wow, so much teaching. And also being able to correct, not in anger, but in real teaching. And he also, the Rebbe Rashab, added that he told this little law from the Talmud that the sages say, whether a person is awake or asleep, we are responsible for our actions. So that means that when a person is what they call absent-minded, that's not an excuse. It's not an excuse that we have to be responsible for our behavior and that we have to recognize that everything is a creation of God. Now, this is a story that's a very well-known story in Chabad. So one time uh, I went outside with a couple of my grandchildren and there was a plant with a leaf and the child took off a leaf. And I said, just to squish it up, and I said, do you know the story about the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, and his father taught him about the leaf, that every leaf has life in it? He said, yes, I know that story. And I said, and you remember that the Rebbe said, it's not good to tear off a leaf and just tear it up. And they went. So what happened in that moment was, I didn't yell at them, but I helped them integrate the story into their own lives. Because sometimes what happens is the story is out there. 
he didn't think of himself like, oh yeah, I just did what the Freya Dicker Rebbe did when he was a little boy. And his father told him everything has life in it. It's not good to do that. So we have moments where we can help the children to integrate truth, integrate stories, integrate reality. Years ago, I had a few young grandchildren and <clears throat> they were here for vacation. And I took the ones who were big enough. We just climbed up a hill in the park while the parents were with the babies. And I had made chocolate chip cookies. And I took the children, these children, and we walked up to a place in between the trees. And I told them a story. And I told them a story, I'm not going to tell you the story, but this story, what happens is that the Baal Shem Tov says that because you said a blessing in this place where no one ever said a blessing before, that you elevated souls that had been in this place and you elevated this place where no one had ever said a blessing before. So I told them the story. <clears throat> and then I said, would anybody like a chocolate chip cookie? Of course, everybody wanted a chocolate chip cookie. And then the big boy who was, I don't know how old he was, maybe seven or eight, he said, oh, I bet nobody ever said a blessing in this place. And I said, you're right. Probably we're going to be the first people. He said, yes, we could be the first people to say the blessing. So a story that they all knew from the Baal Shem Tov about people saying blessings that made a difference, they had a moment to integrate. Now it's my turn to do this. I can do this. And they said the blessing in a real way with authenticity because they knew they had the responsibility of being the person that God sent to say the blessing in this place. So this is, these are methods of integrating the stories, telling the stories, helping the children to integrate the stories. And remember the man who was up there having a tantrum? When children, when th with these two children, every once in a while when a tantrum began, I said, do you remember the man at the airport? Oh, no, no, I don't want to be like that. And it helped them to integrate the story. So teaching is ongoing. First of all, I love these stories. They're very meaningful to me. As I say them and as I hear them, it tells me what I also need to work on for myself. And then we could be better role models of living in this way. And then when we tell the children the stories, we can help them to integrate them, sometimes by talking about it. Sometimes we tell the story and tell something about it. Sometimes we can just muse. That is so interesting. You know, I was also thinking that, yeah. I think I need to pray a little bit slower so that I know what I'm saying instead of being bit, 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 bit. I want to just pray a little bit slower so that I'm saying words that I know what I'm saying to God. We don't even have to say it to the children. We can say it to ourselves in front of the children. So these stories are telling the story of how a Rebbe educated his, ch his child and the child, when the child wrote this in his diary, he was not four or five or 12. He wrote ongoing, but he also wrote later on when he remembered. So we are here to make a godly world and to educate and to shine the light up. And the prophets teach that in the ultimate future, this approach to Torah will be an integral part of people. In other words, everything will be integrated. And God promises, I will place my Torah within them and I will write it upon their hearts. They will no longer teach 
each man his fellow and each man his brother, saying, no God, for all will know me. The Torah will not be seen as a body of knowledge containing laws and concepts, but a medium opening our hearts to the awareness of God. So that is the aim to integrate what we learn in Torah to opening our hearts to the awareness of God. That's what we're here to do. So integrating and helping our children to integrate is essential. And the best way to hasten the oncoming of that era is to begin conducting ourselves in that matter, in that manner at present. To know that we're in God's presence, to practice being in God's presence, means that we're bringing the Aleph into the word Gola, exile, is spelled the same as Gula, which means redemption, except that Gola does not have an Aleph, and Gula does. And Aleph, the first letter of the alphabet, means the one, the one, the one who is in charge, and that is God. So when we work on bringing the Aleph into the world, into where we are, we are working on living in God's presence. When we internalize the message of this prophecy in our lives, the, this light will spread out and we'll find that all of us will be living with hearts that have awareness of the living God, that we'll have the awareness of God inside ourselves, inside us, around us, because that's what really is going on, but it will become more and more integrated. So, we are educating the children, but we're also educating ourselves. And we all are still children in a way. And we have to integrate what we learn. How we do that, there are opportunities. But when we have that opportunity and we recognize it could be in any moment and every day is new and we are, connect, and we are created new every moment. So we have a new opportunity every moment how to say a blessing, what to do, to recognize. So may we do what we're here to do with joy and enthusiasm and may our lights shine. <laughs>